Hi, everybody. We're going to have a really fascinating conversation today, and it's one that hits pretty close to the bone, and that has to do with human sexuality and how so much of what's going wrong in the world today has to do with the shame we carry around sex as a species. We're going to go to that in just a minute with Jerry Weinstock. Jerry, welcome. I'm very very excited to have this conversation because uh, I don't know how anyone ever thought that this was going to be anything but an ugly transformation. <laughs> this this is at the core wound of uh, humanity throughout our history and carrying forward generations of wounds. And so I'd like to start, if you don't mind, by first of all, You've written a a wonderful book. Uh, Tell us just a little bit about this new one that just came out. Just give us a thumbnail synopsis before I start jumping right into it. It's great to be here with you. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from you. Uh, The book is called uh, Our Secret Sex Life, The Key to Humanity's Destiny. And it's basically presenting the hidden connections between sex, society, and ultimately survival. Uh, I've presented a theory that I've kind of developed, uh, which sort of is a a theory of sexual relativity, uh, in which depending upon the story a society tells itself determines the kind of society we create. Uh, Sex is much, much more then we realize uh, sex is the, one of the key determiners, one of the key elements of our humanity. And we have forgotten how fundamental it is, and we can't even imagine how consequential it is. In fact, you even call it the source code to humanity. And in to fact, society, to society. To society. And indeed it is. And can we just... Do you mind if I go ahead and open the conversation uh, by going back uh, several decades to the 1960s? Sure. Because it it starts leading us up to where we are now. Before that, we know where we all were. We live we lived in a patriarchal for patriarchal society globally for several thousand years, and at least a few thousand years. And everybody knew what that game was. The guy'd go to work, and the little woman would take care of the house, and sex was her duty, and it was his expectation. Okay, his right. His right. And so now we move to the 1960s and the sexual revolution: sex, drugs, rock and roll. And at the time, it seems to me, the guys thought, bingo, you can have sex without marrying her anymore. But now we're seeing the consequences of what happened when women became independent. So I'd like you to kind of pick it up from the 60s and bring it forward a bit. Well, I think that one of the key things that happened was that uh, the pill was created and that freed women, and ultimately men, to explore. But up until then, and for (laughs) thousands of years, uh, sex had been controlled. And one of the reasons it had been controlled, the main reason it had been controlled by men, was to ascertain paternity. Men needed to control women sexually. That's the fundamental basis of patriarchy in order to determine whose child a woman bore. And if women were free, there was no way to really be sure. Uh, In hunter-gatherer societies, everything was shared, essentially, and even parenting was shared in a certain way. But once the agricultural revolution began and the uh, crops were planted and places were settled, there wasn't a nomadic lifestyle anymore, Uh, the whole nature of civilization and the relationship between men and women changed. And the most important relationship that changed was the way they related to sexuality. You wanted to talk about the 70s. Well, no, 60s, 70s. No, the the reality is I kind of already laid the foundation for that because once women had the pill, 
And by this time, women had started taking on jobs, although a lot of the jobs available for women in the day were still kind of what you'd see in Mad Men. We had the roles of secretaries. And if we worked our way up into a profession, we were paid less and treated differently, no doubt. But it freed women to not get pregnant, like you just said, to avoid pregnancy. But it also freed men to have affairs with a lot of women without having to marry them. Because up until my parents' generation, you really had to get married if you wanted to have an ongoing sexual relationship with someone. Right. So it was why the the saying was, uh, "Why buy the cow when you get can get the milk for free?" For free, right? Pretty crude, but that's how it was. So with women they started realizing, ooh, there's another side to this. Uh, I am not going to be able to use my sexuality to necessarily nail down a marriage with someone right away, and I do need to start seeking my own independence. So from a ver- for a variety of reasons, women really started stepping up, becoming educated, uh, working hard, 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 trying to move up in positions, whatever their chosen profession was, or whatever the job was to manager or up into the profession. So now that happens, you've got some a little bit of financial uh, security on your own. You don't need a guy. He didn't need to marry you, but you don't need him anymore either. For your you become much choosier about exactly. who you're going to get into bed with. Exactly. And suddenly men who expected sex, that it was their right and a woman's duty, suddenly are finding women are much more choosy, much more selective. And uh, men are finding that, uh, well, you have the whole incel movement as the tip of an iceberg of men's, mm-hmm. what I call it is a dark secret in the heart of men. Uh, And that is that it's it's something that we we really won't admit to ourselves, but we are under the sway of women's sexual power over us to some extent. Men desire women in a way that uh, makes them very... uh, Ashamed if they cannot, if they cannot find a relationship, if they cannot have sex on a regular basis. I don't think women experience the same kind of uh, the same kind of arousal. Different. Not arousal. It's different. It's different. And this dark secret is something that men that actually it's women's superpower uh, that women. Uh, women have this sexual power that attracts men. And once women become empowered, there are many things that they can do with this, uh, with this power that they have. Oh, and we've done everything with it that we're creative enough to figure out throughout the millennia to survive and to get our needs met. So we know the female end of the story, too. I mean, we're, we both have this programmed in us and we, in through our ancestors into our DNA in this lifetime. And so we've learned, we've each learned how to survive, but it's been heavily loaded in a power scale, certainly toward the men and all the externals in life. And what you just said is fascinating because you said it's there's a certain kind of shame and even humiliation to a man if he can't get a woman. Yes. And see we don't so. we don't we women don't really understand that. Maybe just speak to that for a moment longer before we go into how this how this has put us in such an ugly spot of mass shooters, sex trafficking at the most elite levels. Set that up a little bit about this shame and humiliation. Well, as women have become empowered in the past 50, 60, 70 years, I mean, women didn't have the vote until fairly recently. Women couldn't have a credit card until fairly recently, historically. Uh, So women were really uh, men's property. Uh, in 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 a sense, uh, you, you know, you, every wedding you go to, even uh, last month, it's a man giving his daughter to another man. True. And she takes the man's name when they get married. Uh, women were subservient for thousands of years, have been, and as they and men control them, that's the way the religion, the, at least the Judeo-Christian religions, the, the God religions, not the goddess religions, 
were designed to justify men's control of women and their sexuality so they could have children and property and power. Uh, this was what men And free access to sex. Yes, of course. Dominant. And when men began to lose their position and the, the uh, ability to, you, you know, there was a time not so long ago when every woman had to be married and their family was rushing around trying to set them up because there was no other way for a woman to survive. So men had this <laughs> had this uh, situation in which they were, I mean, they just had their pick. It was, uh, you know, in a way, if, when you look at it, it was almost a kind of subtle faux slavery uh, that women endured. Oh, yeah. And not even so subtle. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hate to use terms like that, but. Yeah, it's true. So uh, as women now have in the last decades become empowered and men uh, have to actually deal with them as equal human beings, actual equal human beings who are sexually superior, perhaps in some ways, uh, equal human beings who can excel in university and education, who can earn significant amounts of money, who do not need a man Men have to work for sex. <laughs> Men have to. It's not a given. It's not a guarantee. And the loss of that guarantee, that sexual guarantee, sex is like a, for many men, sex is like a drug. And they will do anything to get their fix. Mm -hmm. And now that their fix that has been uh, not guaranteed anymore, they become very angry. And they look for all sorts of reasons why they're so angry. And they can't admit it's the shame of their um, of their impotence, in a sense, their cultural impotence. So they scapegoat. They scapegoat immigrants. They scapegoat race. They scapegoat. They find all sorts of things to be angry at instead of looking and owning the truth of what's happened, which is that they've lost their access to their drug of choice, their sex, and the control of women in their life. That I mean, that is so basic and really rings true when you get down to it. And finding trying to find ways to supplant that. Technologic, te uh, technology has done an interesting job of supplanting that. Certainly a lot of what has driven technology, even the whole... Um, beta tape but back in the day movement was pornography that's was what pornography really exactly it and moved the the video industry forward so guys could and of course this was happening in the 80s and the 90s um after this shift had already begun happening among women men began turning to externals like like uh, pornography for example to satisfy that need but that appears not to be enough, or we would not have this kind of rage we're seeing. And translating this, if you may, into the notion of these young, lonely men who are, are the ones involved in mass shootings almost exclusively. And then if you would take it to the power elite, because these guys have some massive egoic inadequacies as well, which leads to the story of sex trafficking. If you'd get into both of those, please. Sure. Uh the you know the uh, the there's something about the access availability of pornography uh, online, which allows men, young boys, and young men to you know uh, release sexual release is uh, just a fingertip away. Uh, they don't even have <laughs> they don't even have to go to a local uh, store to buy a magazine. Uh, it's right there. And what they're finding out in terms of the research is that it's affecting, it, it's very addictive. Highly, yeah. Um, and especially for young developing brains, uh, boys as young as eight uh, are finding it, using it if they have, a, a, you know, early puberty. And uh, by the time they're in their teens, they're really... 
uh, so used to the not the this easy release, which is it's like sugar. It's not nourishing. It's not food. It's this high, this brief high. But ultimately, if that's all your diet is, it becomes a poison. Uh, their brains are affected. They become socially uh, fearful. They don't practice. They don't. The, the, there used to be a time when the drive to for that release, let us say, uh, would <laughs> urge them to get out, to go date, to ask a girl to a dance or to a movie, and somehow negotiate the mating dance. Uh, and they would they and they would be fearful and anxious yeah. and scared, but they would do it and they would learn and they would eventually develop confidence. Right. Uh, they don't have to do that too much anymore. And so they become increasingly, increasingly isolated, increasing it's like a vicious cycle. And after a while they are they're terrified of actually interacting with a live woman, a live female. Uh, in terms of yeah. socially and in any other way, especially if they have they, this female may have expectations of them sexually and personally. Uh, so they it becomes a vicious cycle in which some of them become quite isolated, quite and then quite angry that they cannot have relationships and that women are rejecting them. Another interesting point, you, you brought this up a bit ago, um, when it comes to their developmental years and their development of their brain and their neural networks, um, you're talking about l l young kids, pubescent boys and through teenage years, um, becoming dopamine junkies. That's a much slower process if you're engaging, like you said, with a real girl. Everything happens in a slower amount of time. You have conflicting chemicals, like you said, of uh, feeling perhaps anxiety or nervousness that slows the process down. And when everything finally comes together, there's just this wonderful, sweet sort of bringing together of a lot of emotional chemicals. Those aren't present when you're getting just a quick dopamine fix that's why i compared it to sugar yeah this is sugar is not a food sugar is nice once in a while right uh, and sugar can be added to some things but a diet of sugar is a poison and a diet of screen sex, screen sex yeah is ha has a very a uh, negative effect, I think. And uh, well, how could you slow the process down when your brain is looking at that speed of satisfaction to actually engage? It takes time, patience, a lot of time, and a lot of patience sometimes to get into a relationship with a girl, and a um, lot of having to deal with stress and anxiety and 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 learning what it yeah. does and doesn't work. It's it's. It's life. <laughs> it's life. So all of that life, all of those emotions have been eliminated. All of the vulnerability, the risk taking, everything that young men need to really develop themselves, exactly. develop their exactly. their prowess in life, not just in sex, through being able to impress girls and figure out a way to negotiate, you know, a relationship. It's gone. Absolutely. And so at a certain point when these uh, young men are uh, in their later teens, they are really socially inept, socially frightened and uh, <sighs> desperate, desperate. And that's why, you know, they turn to certain kinds of uh, ideologies that justify them and make them feel better about their, themselves and their situation. And some of these become violent, like the incels, the involuntary like the incels and the, the, end up, we read about them in the newspapers where their mothers say, but he was such a nice boy. He was quiet. Well, yeah, there was a lot else going on there. And so now we're looking, that's kind of shredding society from the bottom up when we reach, read these horrific, almost daily headlines now. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, I remember saying 10 years ago, this is going to be a daily thing. This is going to increase. It's not going to stop. And we are at that point now.
I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. Now let's look at the top. Everybody knows about the Jeffrey Epstein case and the players that were swept into that. And you say it's very interesting because at that level, the ego operates in a different way and inadequacies come up big time. Right. I, the uh, people at the top, uh, the powerful, uh, the rich, they don't have a problem of availability. There are many women who are available to them. Uh, I think that they suffer from a fear of inadequacy and that they're, the re they're driven to younger and younger women, virginal women who have very little experience so that they, uh, so that to bolster their ego on some level. The, there's, uh, there's something, I forget who it was who said it, that uh, women are afraid that men will kill them, and men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that is sort of underlying that. A, I can't imagine what a man. What I'm a <laughs> an older man, <laughs> but I can't imagine w wanting to have to make love to someone who had no life experience who hadn't developed even the artistry of lovemaking, who who was, uh, <laughs> who was could barely play chopsticks on the sexual piano. What would that, what kind, what would that, why? I think huh? I can only understand that as someone who is uh, afraid of being found less than and inadequate in some way and knows that uh, for a 16-year-old or 15 or 17-year-old who's had very little in the terms of world and sexual experience, uh, they're safe. I also think it's a, um, a kind of taboo thrill, viag cum Viagra, uh, the, you know, that only, only the rich and only the powerful c could go to his island and pay for the privilege of this taboo breaking thrill uh so it's i don't know it, it's and there it, has to be i find it so distasteful it's it's even talking yes. about it creeps me out and at the, on, on the other hand too as you said earlier there is a sense of absolute control and dominance over uh, a virginal like young girl you right. know they don't have to deal with a real woman the power they don't have to deal with a real woman no. They don't have to deal with an embodiment of the goddess. They deal with child. And what's so devastating about this, not just from a um, not just from the harm it does to the to the to the young to the young girls and the young women, of course, is the how it corrupts our society, how the rich and powerful get brought into this, and then they are so easily blackmail there's extortion there's all sorts of ways that they then have can be controlled and who knows in how what levers of power absolutely have been compromise these guys are often don't rise to power unless i mean many books have been written about this unless they have been compromised so thus they're controllable right but when we speak to this issue there's something else that comes up i remember about um maybe 25, 30 years ago, I was talking to <clears throat> having this very frank discussion with a number of women, including my own mother, only to find out that almost all of them had been molested as young girls. Wow. And what a shock. Oh, yes. And I was absolutely shocked at how many of them had been. And so it brings up a larger question, too, of not just these rich and powerful people who can go to an island and have beautiful young girls, but all over the world throughout history, fathers violating their daughters, uncles, their nieces. And what 
is it still the same story about wanting power and control over this beautiful virginal stuff? What is it that has created an epidemic historically of of uh, molestation and incest, pedophilia, and now not just girls, even boys as well? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's throughout history. I don't think, I, I don't know, but I don't think that, uh, I think that, that, that there is a toxicity to patriarchy. Uh, go back to the original story, the Garden of Eden. The, the idea that a woman, a female, Eve, was birthed from a man's rib is so <laughs> preposterous, but go ahead. So ridiculous. <laughs> so insane. Yeah, I, taught, uh, I was taught that in Sunday school. Yep. So insane. And yet an entire civilization over thousands of years has been built on this idea. <laughs> I think there's a toxicity t- and there's a toxicity to the patriarchy uh, that comes, I think, has a lot of different forms. It has polluted our sexuality in many ways. Uh, yes. Our sexuality is a natural resource. It's the inner fire. It, it, uh, it is the source. Uh, it is uh, the source of evolution, sexual selection, it is the source in so many ways, and we have been uh, we have been unplugged. We have been made ignorant of it. We have so that it's not something we could have even talked about very much until recently. Uh, sex, as I said, is much more important than we realize, and it has been. I think the the uh, the the distortions of um, a woman being birthed from a man's rib. And of course, the original sin of eating the forbidden fruit, which is code for sex, not just sex, but the sexual mysteries that were practiced in the temples of the goddess before she was uh, banished from heaven and slandered as the whore of Babylon. Uh, this toxicity and poison is part of, I think, what uh, fuels. Uh, oh, I agree. I think everybody watching this will agree with with that. So here we come into a state now where where the world is becoming increasingly, in a sense, more authoritarian on a lot of levels, and we have mu- the rise of much more conservative movements. I mean just the reversal of Roe v. Wade and shutting down a woman's white rights over her own this body. This is the last gasp of the patriarchy. This is, this is the last gasp. At the same time, protecting uh, every kind of um, gun right, you know, right Absolutely. to bear arms, big time protection on our right to kill, but not for a woman to choose. So we all see, We, I mean, everyone watching this has been squeezed uh, on an emotional level uh, to the point of despair um, with most of the women watching over Roe v. Wade uh, alone. And so it's the last gasp of these people, of these power structures and these men, these toxic patriarchal figures trying to control humanity from the top down. So um, the corollary for women is we went to school, we got jobs, we're doing well, we can be very, very selective and we can do without a relationship. We don't have to have one. So what is the corollary going to have to be for men in order to bring anything back into balance without, you know, decades more of violence and anger and resentment? I believe that women have to lead and to teach. I think men cannot get there on their own. I mean, Some men can, of course, but uh, women have much greater access, first of all, to the source, to sexuality. Women are wired for much greater, uh, as I wrote in that article and in my book, uh, there's a myth about 
uh, Zeus and Hera, the two, the god and goddess in Greek in the Greek pantheon of mythology, uh, were arguing, husband and wife, who enjoys sex more, and they decided they couldn't decide, so they asked a figure by the name of Tiresias. He was a great prophet, but he had been for seven years a woman. So they figured if anyone knows who enjoys sex more, it would be Tiresias. So they ask him, and he says, men experience one-tenth of what a woman does. And uh, you just have to listen to anyone making love, I mean, any couple making love, and you yeah. can hear the difference. Women yeah. sing, and men grunt for the most part. Yeah, right. <laughs> Women do op are doing arias, and men are kind of, well, <laughs> grunting. Well, it's just a greater... Uh, so what, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think that women... Uh, first of all, have to reclaim their sexuality. And I think that uh, by reclaiming their sexuality, they will then be even more discriminating and begin to teach the men in their lives. And if the men want to be with the women, they will have to learn. Women have that superpower. They can, you know, I, I brought up uh, the story of Lysistrata, also a kind of ancient story, which seems quite relevant, especially when it comes to the abortion issue. Uh, I mean, no, Bette Midler tweeted, you know, maybe we should uh, do what Lysistrata did. Lysistrata was in the middle of the Peloponnesian War between Greece and Troy. Uh, she decided that she was going to organize the women of Athens to refuse to have sex with their lovers and husbands until the men laid down their arms and made peace. And both sides, both the women get, as a sisterhood yeah. uh, did this and the men agreed <laughs> because what's more important than dying is sex. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And a couple of cute little movies have been made along that theme to get some political action right, where right, women in town decided. Right, right. To so I, I think, yeah. look, I think that we need to, uh, and, that, and that is not just women, it's men as well. It's every individual. Uh, freedom, sovereignty starts at the root. Sovereignty starts with our sexuality. Our sexuality has been hacked by patriarchy, by religion, by shame. We have all, this whole civilization has experienced a collective trauma of shame. We, no one, I, you, no one comes into this culture, this matrix, and at three or four realizes there's something to be ashamed of between your legs. There's something that is not okay and is continually, continually reinforced, whether it's the words being beeped on television, whether it's in so many ways, I can't even enumerate them all now. Right. But every pubescent child is shamed about their sexuality, about their body. And even if they're not conscious of it, we are all unconsciously, collectively traumatized by shame. On some level, I think that you can consider this a sexual, collective sexual abuse that humanity has experienced, which has exiled us from our bodies and exiled us from the body of the planet as well. If we have lost touch with the inner fire of our sexuality and have lost uh, and are shamed somehow of our human beingness, which is sexual, uh, we are, you know, they say that people, individuals who have been sexually abused as children often engage in self-destructive behavior as adults, unconsciously. Is it possible that as a civilization, we are engaging in unconscious, self-destructive behavior because of the trauma of shame that we experience? I'd say yes. Can a species, can a species uh, 
that's ashamed of the way they create new lives survive, or to put it more bluntly, are we fucking up the world because our fucking is fucked up? I would say that's a very good argument. I think there's a lot of truth in what you've said, the whole notion of shame alone. And so what I'm hearing you say that right now, the most immediate path is for women to raise their daughters in a new way, for women to start standing up for themselves in a new way. And this the kind of treatment and desires they'd like to have met with their partners. And even, I mean, it's not as though there aren't resources. There are a lot of really lovely resources in terms of ancient books and texts to more modern texts that go into more elevated levels of Tantra and understanding sexuality from a more energetic divine uh healing in yang yes. point of view there's so many healing our sexuality uh, yeah. individually and collectively i think should be a priority uh I think we so. are we are on the brink of self destruction and i think that uh though it seems un, un, you know inconceivable i think healing our sexuality might go a long way towards bringing us back from the brink I couldn't agree more with you. So it has to start with us. And you say, uh, for the time being, because the men don't know the way just yet, it really is down to the women to figure it out, find the way, teach the men, teach our sons, teach our daughters and our grandchildren that their bodies and their desires are a beautiful, natural thing, just as much as a flower popping open in the springtime. I think right. I think your message is right on. And, and I'm not saying that we want, need more sex. That's not no, I know what you're saying. saying. It's the I'm saying that mm -hmm. we have an inner fire, and like any fire, it can burn. It can warm, it can cook, but it can destroy as well. Sex in ancient goddess-worshipping civilizations was holy. It was the original blessing. It was sacred. Yes. It, was, uh, it was the portal to transcendence, a gateway to other dimensions. Sex was a what there was an energy there that they had learned. That's why they called them sexual mysteries. They had learned to harness, to cultivate, and to uh, use for the sake of civilization, for the benefit of civilization. So, on that note, <clears throat> the women have their work cut out for them, and the <laughs> them. don't they always? Oh yeah, don't they always? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> And what the, else is new? They need to grow up and stop being big babies. If we say, hey, you know, that's not exactly working for me, uh, don't fall apart, crumble, and, you know, curl up in a ball and go watch porn. Just hang in there, you know, see what it is that women want. Learn how to be sweet with one another, how to simply even care and touch and be affectionate with one another to begin with. I mean, there are a lot of simple starting ways. And so, and again, this happens not just between adults, but also in the teaching with our child of our children. I think that what you're saying is so important. Until we stop this mass shame, I don't see how we have really any chance to transform this whole spiritual transformation and enlightenment we all talk about. I don't see that happening without this transforming myself. Yeah, any yeah. Final thoughts. Before we say goodbye, any final thoughts? Oh, your book. I just ordered it. I haven't read it. it it's, a, it's a series of novels, and it's called The Secret Sex Life of Angels. And I thought, I want to see what he's up to with this, because it's really centered around ISIS. So maybe just give us a little tease. I, I'm going to read it on a plane soon. Well, it's, uh, it, it, it's all the things I wanted to say when I was a little bit younger, uh, 10, 15 years ago. And... Uh, didn't wanted to hide behind fiction because I thought it was a little too out there and a little too wild. And then as uh, I got older and uh, mortality started to look <laughs> me come close, I thought, well, I, maybe I better just say it. Uh, but it, it's uh, sort of a Da Vinci Code uh, meets the Kama Sutra in a way. It's uh, about about the education of a man, in fact. And it's uh, kind of inspired by a visionary dream I had several decades ago, which has actually been the path for in my life for the last 30 years. 
So uh, I am very excited by it. There's going to be, I have another few books planned. So it'll be five, six, perhaps seven in the series. But I'm very anxious to hear what you think. Well, I'll be... uh... I'll be on an airplane soon. It'll, it should be arriving, I think, today or tomorrow. <laughs> and then um, I'll let you know. As soon as I get into it, I'll let you know. But meanwhile, okay, I very much appreciate the articles you're writing. Which portals are you writing through right now, which is where I found your work? Uh, Medium. Medium. Yeah, right. Medium. So, and, uh, you know, I have a website, uh, mm-hmm. ijweinstock.com. Good. And uh, the books are available on Amazon. Yep. And I uh, think think that uh, this area is key to humanity's destiny. I couldn't agree more. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about this today. You know, it's a very delicate subject for all human beings because we have been yes. made to sh- feel shameful. And so I think we need to talk about it out in the open, have adult discussions around it, and start playing a little bit. Let's make life a little more fun instead of shameful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. For your time. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Okay, everybody, again, as you just heard, you can find Jerry's work by going to ijweinstock.com. His books are also available on Amazon. I'm really excited to see what's happening with The Secret Sex Life of Angels. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you might also want to consider joining Patreon, which allows me to keep all of this content free and available to everyone. And if you're looking for like-minded souls, you might also enjoy my online community called Our Neighborhood. Links to join are in the description.